some similarities with the previous talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about different <coughs> forms of uh, communication technology uh, and how that and the content of messages and how uh, this plays into whether deception is okay, not okay, whether it's tolerated, whether people use it. Okay. Um, I thought, do I have a clicker? Yeah, please. I thought long and hard about what kinds of slides <laughs> you can see from the first bullet point that <laughs> communicate that uh, deception is really kind of everywhere. <coughs> and the second bullet point shows you that without, without deception, you really don't have very much at all. Um, and I'm sorry about this title. Um, any questions on this slide? <laughs> shows my literature review. <laughs> it's a very, very fine print because as you can tell, I've actually cited all of your papers. <laughs> um, this, slide, this slide presents some data. And um, there's a pretty big effect here because the end is so small, it's only significant at the one uh, the five percent level of one tail test. But that's justified by my hypothesis. Um, in this slide, I think I'm going to have to sh skip over because it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was fun. <laughs> um, here's the paper. I wrote this paper a long time ago. Um, this is this is all in conjecture. This is a, <coughs> this is a, a stack dump game. You've got an equilibrium here. This is payoff. This is a risk dominant. You've got one here that's payoff dominant. All this conjecture says that you always prefer that the other person plays B because you make more, eight versus seven, nine versus one. <coughs> Therefore, you should always signal. This person gets to send a signal to this person. And the signal should always be B. And because this person knows that a signal B doesn't mean anything, the person should ignore the signal and play safe. So on this point is that communication won't help here. So I did this. When you don't have a signal, probability of playing B is 35%. When you have a signal, the probability of playing B, given that you received or sent a signal B is the same, is 94%. And this is significantly different. Um, in fact, it's too significantly different. Records complain that the test was, they complain about it, so I had to do intermediate treatment that didn't get this result. <laughs> Um, so this is interesting. It shows the signals, and, and the message is very simple. The message was, I intend to play A or I intend to play, I intend to play, and then it's A or B and six or one. So communication helped here, and it wasn't any real deception. Uh, currency of draws and trade like I changed. See the payoff. <coughs> since payoff is eight, and this is eight, and this is stack time. When you change it to twelve and twelve, this is now a prison dilemma. So with the same subject pool. I did this, the same message technology, the same thing. Um, what do you get? 80% of the time people, the other one's 95% of the time people signal B. Here, 80% are signaling B, but only 10% of the buyer of the of both player one and player two play B. So everybody's saying B, nobody's actually doing it, and nobody believes it. This is deception. It seems to be acceptable to use deception. Um, sort of because everybody can figure out that this is the equilibrium. This was done in, at Pompeo, uh, very smart students there, and they played a lot of the matrix games. So I think they could figure it out. And because this was the only equilibrium, it was okay <coughs> to be deceptive somehow. Everybody was doing it. It wasn't, it wasn't unexpected. I, I wouldn't say this is like playing poker, but when you play poker, certainly people expect you to be deceptive. And certainly there's no sanction. So I'm, part of my argument is that when you have a unique equilibrium that's a bad social equilibrium, you need something more than a simple message to get you away from it. But when you have multiple equilibria, then a simple message might be able to help with equilibrium structure. <coughs> so there's a long history um, going back over 20 years finding that in coordination games, a simple message can actually do a good job. Very good job. Okay. Um, Here's another paper. This is uh, with Jody Brands. Um, <coughs> complicated. So let me let me kind of walk you through it. So you can play. Uh, I don't know if it's C or D. That may not be the right letter. A or B, whatever. C or D. 
So uh, there's a message from player one to player two. And the message is, I intend to play C, or I intend, intend to play D. OK, so player two can, can choose C, and then each person gets two, no matter what. Why would you do this? It's dominating. Why would you do this? It seems a strange thing to do, OK? But it could be that player one worries about player two choosing C. In fact, only 5% chose C. But player one's actually worried about this, and a fair number of them said that they were going to play C. Why did they do that? Because player two can then also can play D and think that they're going to get nine. Okay? Um, so what happens after this? There's a signal, then there's simultaneous play, and then player two, if this is where they are, player two could transfer two and change six, nine to eight, seven. But the real interest that we had was when player two plays D and player two plays D, you get to 12-3, okay? And at 12-3, you can convert 12-3 to 2-2. Two, two. You can essentially punish, okay? Now, the point of this paper, really, is that you can get to this cell in one of two ways. You can get to this cell by player one saying he or she's going to play C and then playing D, which would be deception, or person player one says, I'm going to play D, and I'm going to be selfish, and then does play D. So no deceptions involved. Notice that a message does not really change anything. You should always be playing D, no matter what player one says. So it doesn't change your, your action space, basically. Um, the only thing here is whether player two cares about whether deception is being used. It doesn't actually change anything. It's just, what's your reaction to deception? Is someone sending a false message? So what we get is I did the strategy method first, and I had that there's a punishment rate of 27% when uh, deception was used, and 12% when it wasn't used, okay? And then the journal made me go back and do this with direct response, just with management points. Um, they said, we don't believe this strategy method stuff. I said, but I have a paper. Um, so I did it with direct response. What did I get? The levels were very different. So I had 56% punishment rate uh, with C being signaled and 27% with D being signaled. So the rates doubled, but the, the treatment effect was still there. It still doubled. Okay? So people don't like deception very much, even when it doesn't change their choice. Okay? So deception here wasn't really allowed. I mean, people did it. I think it was about 35%, 40% of the C message. Um, but it bothered people. So actually the right thing, the best thing to do would be to say you're playing D and play D. You don't get punished that much and you do best. So honesty here is a, is a better policy. Um, okay, this looks a little complicated. So there's a first mover and a second mover. The first mover can take an outside option. Um, or enter into this uh, contractual arrangement with B. Um, B has a choice between not rolling a die and rolling a die. B will get 14 if B chooses don't roll and A is chosen in, um, and A would get zero. Okay? <coughs> this dominates the possible payoffs for, the payoffs for B if B chooses to roll. So in effect, the effort cost of four here. Um, so choices aren't observable. Okay? And the reason they're not observable is that you can get zero as a payoff if you pay in one of two ways. You can get it by being selfish, or you can get it by being, being rolling the die, but there's a one chance of six failure. So you could have that. There could be bad luck, or it could be that um, he was being selfish. You can't tell. So you can't prove anything. Um, what happens if he chooses roll? An expectation of 10 10. And there's a six sided die adjustable for this. So, what should A do if A uh, thinks he is going to be selfish? Well, the way we set this up is that, um, no, we didn't set this one up this way. So, B should always choose don't. And A knows that, and A should always choose out. It's a bad social outcome. This is 5 5, and this is 10 10. So, we use communication. What do we get with communication? <coughs> we get a large improvement in the proportion of who 
and social outcomes, getting to hear. Um, this is 20% without messages. This is 50% with messages. And it's something like 70% when the messages include a promise. So this paper is called Promises and Partnership, published in 2006. And it deals with the idea that messages, but particularly personalized messages. So this one we did with personalized messages. You can write anything you want except identifying yourself. And when these personalized messages included promises or statements of intent, they're particularly effective. So people hold on to their promises typically, although there is a proportion of people that don't honor their promises, but it's probably about 20%. Okay? So we get this result, we get that promises are effective. Uh, people aren't very aren't frequently deceptive when they're making promises, and promises are typically believed, and it leads to better social outcomes. Okay? Um, this is from China Solutions from 2011. It's a slightly different version. This has to do with um, hidden information. So there are two different types. Uh, one type has high talent, one type has low talent. Um, <coughs> the agent knows which type he or she is, but the principal doesn't know it. Okay. So if the agent's the low type, then the, the in both cases, so of course, because there's a there's an information set here. Um, if if A chooses out, I didn't label it, if A chooses out, then you should get five. If A chooses in, he has a choice. <coughs> okay, and here he has a choice of awarding seven to each person if it's the low type, if he's the low type, or taking ten, being selfish and giving the uh, giving A zero. That's for the low talent type. For the high talent type, um, <coughs> still has the same option but also has an option here where this is an expectation 10-10. Okay. So the high type has some talent, can actually get an expectation 10-10, where the low talent type can only get to 7-7. You could this, think of this as representing some sort of Spence signaling model, or a Spence model where these are managerial jobs and these are clerical jobs. And you're gonna hope that uh, the person who's the clerical job will actually do the job and not pretend to be the manager because it doesn't have the talent to be the manager. So what should the first mover do? Well, under selfish preferences, this is one third of the time you're going to get 10. So that's 10 thirds and over here. Um, if you enter, you're going to get zero. Three and a third is less than five, so you should choose out. Bad social outcome again. Um, what do we do? We allow messages, same sort of situation. And what we find, the interesting thing that we find is that, the particularly interesting thing is that low B types over here, um, they send messages. Many of them send messages saying, hey, I'm a low type, but I'm going to choose this four. Okay, so they confess to being the low type, but there's a parade of improvement available. The seven seven is better than the five five. So because there, it seems like because there's a well, in fact, some people say it in the messages. Because there's a Pareto improvement that's available, people seem to be willing to go along with it and tell the truth. And every time that someone said, "I'm a low